Hello, I'm Rebecca Lewington. Welcome to our podcast. I'm here with Melissa Uribe, who's particularly focused on a newish technology called FUSA, Functional Safety, which is a critical enabling technology for autonomous vehicles. More than a million people are killed every year in automobile accidents, and we'd really like that number to go down when we take humans out of the loop. She also represents Micron on the Automotive Electronics Council, which establishes common part qualification and quality system standards. So, Melissa, thanks very much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. So, first, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your background and what's your current role? Um, well, so I started out in Micron in 2010. I was part of the mnemonics acquisition. And when I came in, I was quality and reliability manager for embedded and automotive. So I've been in automotive quite a while now. Um, so I've always had kind of that quality and reliability focus. Um, but more recently, um, I've moved over in 2019 into functional safety. Excellent. Now, something you told me that I should ask you is what's the difference between quality and safety? Because I'm sure most people like me think they're kind of the same thing. Sure. I think that's a, a common misconception. Um, quality and safety do have some commonalities. Um, for safety, you do want a low failure rate. Um, that's pretty critical as well. But really, they're not the same. Um, quality is really the measure of a failure in time. So the amount of failures, a failure rate, um, where safety is more the predictability of failures. So uh, your goal is to reduce the risk from failures. In a way with safety, you kind of accept that there are going to be failures. Um, that's just a, a foregone conclusion that there will be failures. But what you want to do is understand what those failures are and figure out how to manage them so that you can keep the car and the people out of harm. Right. And so going on from that, what's functional safety? It's one of those terms where I know what functional means and I know what safety means, but I'm putting them together and they don't mean anything <laughs> anymore. Right. So functional safety is really um, the absence of unacceptable risk. And, so unacceptable uh, risk. Unacceptable like risk, yeah. And those are, in this case, from electronic systems in the car. Okay. Um, can you say a bit more about this? I gather there's two different types of fault. There's systematic there errors are. and random hardware faults. Exactly. There are two, two different classifications of faults. So we have systematic and random hardware faults. Um, the systematic faults are really more things like you would think of an error in the design or the firmware. Mm -hmm. And so for systematic faults, they really can affect every component, just depending on if you're in the situation that brings out that failure. So mm -hmm. really to address a systematic fault, you really have to look back to your development process and make sure that you are following best practices for um, the design, the verification, simulation, validation of your product to make sure that you can minimize or, or eliminate those systematic errors. The other classification of faults is random hardware faults, and that's more my specialty. Um, these are more like defects. So these are uh, those little faults that appear at random um, over the lifetime of the product. And so for random hardware faults, what you really have to do is figure out how to manage those failures. So um, we look to incorporate things like safety mechanisms in order to detect the failures. Which leads me to my next question. That's another somewhat opaque term. What's a safety mechanism in this context? Right. Um, a safety mechanism is, is essentially a feature that is built into the product that allows you to do sort of an introspection. So to really look for faults that are happening inside the part as you're operating. So um, it allows us to detect the fault and then alert the system that something is wrong. And so there's really some key elements to having uh, this type of safety mechanism. The first is it has to be able to detect a fault. Uh, the second is it has to alert the system. And the third is that it has to alert quickly enough that the system can react before there is harm. Before it enters an unacceptable state. Exactly. See, the I unacceptable risk. <laughs> right. So, there, yeah, go on. 
Well, so I was going to say there are a few examples that you can see in some standard products today that are kind of like a safety mechanism. Um, you can see alert flags in storage products um, that come back in the response protocol. Um, and you can see things like um, ECC right link registers in things like the LP DDR5. So these are standard features that are alerting um, the customer, the host system, that there is a problem with the device. I get it. So yeah, basically, no surprises. You don't want anything. You don't. The, the, the important thing is that the system is able to uh, introspect to know mm -hmm. when it's going wrong for itself. Exactly. So let's let's jump back to managing random hardware failures. How do you do that? Well, really, what you want to do is uh, start by understanding what those hardware failures could be. So we really start with understanding the base failure rate of our product and then determine what safety mechanisms we could use to detect those faults. Um, a fault that is detected and alerted to the system no longer poses that safety risk. Um, any fault that is undetected then becomes a residual failure rate, so a, a leftover failure. Um, so really to determine that failure rate, we do an in-depth analysis of our product using a process called failure mode effects and diagnostic analysis. Um, we analyze the faults of every functional block in the device, figure out what the failure rate is for those faults, and then overlay our effectiveness of the safety mechanisms to figure out if we can detect the failures and how many we can detect. Um, the process is really part of a standard for um, functional safety called the ISO 262062. Yeah. <laughs> now, I read one of your papers. You're going very, very deeply into the design <laughs> of the chip. You're pretty much going down to the silicon mm -hmm. level to, to, to assign risk to every single piece of that and add them all together and figure out. Exactly you are. What's going on. You are. It's a pretty in depth process. Right. It's really interesting. Now, um, when you add all this together, I gather we're trying to meet a, meet another standard called ACIL D, which right. know, sounds like we something from Lord to, of the Rings. What, what yeah. is that? <laughs> so we refer to ACIL. ACIL is part of the twenty six twenty six two document. Um, it's the ah. Uh, yeah, it's an automotive safety integrity level. And ASIL really refers to uh, the level that you're able to meet with your product. So there are a few different elements to that. There are um, requirements based on the systematic side. So um, in other words, uh, what uh, amount of uh, or type of um uh, development process you're going to go through. So the specific requirements are, are more stringent as you get to a uh, more challenging uh, ASIL level. And also you have to meet uh, certain requirements then for the random hardware side uh, that relate to the failure rates. So for an ASIL D, which is the most stringent in the 262, that is 10 failures in 1 billion hours and that's for the system. Um, we are just a memory component in the system. So we don't get that whole allocation of failures. Wow. So yeah. this translates to memory and storage things that really, to several significant figures, never fail in an unpredictable and unacceptable manner. Right. Right. Exactly. They can fail, but they never fail in a way that's undetectable. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. So, that's our goal. So, <laughs> so, well, what, what products is this going to be built into and what innovations were necessary to make it work? Right. Well, so our first product that we're building this into is an LP5. And um, so that LP5? product, LPDDR5, LP5. sorry, a uh, low, low product power DDR. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's our first product that this is being built into. Um, but uh, there are other products, uh, memory products in our portfolio, um, including storage products that we will continue to develop as well. Right. And the LPs, LP, low power DRAM is an increasingly big player in the automotive space, I gather, going forward. It is. It is. Um, so, yes, that is, uh, that is why our focus has started on a, a low power DDR5. Okay, what else has to be done? to make this work in a, at a system level? Right, well, b 
besides uh, working on our safety features um, that would uh, allow us to work within the existing JEDEC protocol, we also have to work to enable the ecosystem. So working with our customers and chipset vendors to make sure that they enable the use of those features so that they can be used in safety systems. Got it. So it's really a team effort. Mm -hmm. um, so next question, how new is this idea? How new is functional safety? Um, when to put it another way, how do people try and achieve the same level of safety today? Right. So um, historically, in order to achieve functional safety um, with memory devices, I, I don't think the memory devices were very well understood in the automotive safety applications. So the early approach was uh, really more of a, a brute force method. Honestly, it was uh, more to build in redundant memory subsystems. So by doing this, you could have two memory subsystems, one that would run the application and the other was kind of like a double check. So um, in a way like the safety mechanism for the first one. And so if the two memory subset, subsystems provided the same response, then you could expect that uh, those systems were running cleanly and you could trust the results. Um, of course, that assumed you know, that defects are random and wouldn't hit both at the same time in the same way. Um, but if your memory subsystems then provided you different results, you knew that something was wrong and you could move to a safe state, which would be something like pulling the car over to the side of the road or turning off the system and allowing the driver to take over, something like that. Um, but honestly, the, the tough part about the memory subsystems, about having dual memory subsystems, is, is that uh, you also have to consider the systematic faults. And so if you design two memory subsystems with identical oh. components, they can fail in the same way. And they, in theory, would be under the same circumstance at the same time. So that may not be sufficient to cover systematic faults. And in that case, you may need to build separate memory subsystems that have different designs, maybe oh. even different suppliers. And now we're sounding like the way you build systems for space, for space exploration. And that's, <laughs> right. that doesn't sound like it's very, 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 well, not very economically viable or really very functional for something you're trying to build into millions and millions of vehicles. Right. So your approach is cheaper, faster, better. It's sounding pretty good. It is. Yeah. It allows us. So, so we're addressing those systematic errors. Um, we are building in alarms and so instead of building a system with, um, you know, dual memory subsystems, um, you can just build the one memory subsystem. And so it's definitely cheaper than having that redundancy. Um, we also provide uh, safety documentation mm -hmm. that assist our customers, the integrators with building our parts into their system. And the system bandwidth can even be improved when the errors are detected closer to the point of failure rather than relying on waiting for them to right. propagate further into the system. Right, which leads me to my next question, which is the downstream impact. Now mm -hmm. you've got functional, functionally safe memory and in the future functionally safe other things. What does that, what does that enable? Right. Really, this enables the the autonomy concept for, um, you know, autonomous driving cars, maybe assisted uh, driver assistance cars as well. So it it builds in those advanced driver assistance systems. Um, these systems, in theory, can can help with congestion, um, maybe improved efficiency, less stress to the driver. Right. Um, and like you said earlier, fewer fatalities. Um, I've even heard maybe fewer emissions from that as well. Oh. Right, right. Yeah, so I, I really think full autonomy, it, it can't happen without a dedicated functional safety approach. Right, so Melissa, you are, well, if you don't get this right, it's gonna be your fault if we're not, <laughs> don't not have self driving Great. cars. <laughs> <laughs> so um, switching gears a bit, um, I wanted to ask you about what you do, what you do as you represent Micron on the Automotive Electronics Council. <laughs> what does that entail? I don't know why you're laughing, but right. I'm sure you'll tell Right. Me. So, yeah, so um, it, it actually isn't really related to safety at all. But yes, I, I am oh. our Micron rep for um, Automotive Electronics Council, which is the uh, governing board for developing qualification standards for integrated circuits, 
um, electronic devices, components that are used in cars. Um, so uh, on that board, we are uh, technical members. Um, so Micron, um, you know, influences what's in the standards and uh, helps to define those standards and, um, you know, continue the, the growth of those standards as the technology changes. Um, and yeah, so uh, I contribute directly to that. Today, we actually have uh, three different standards that are, are active uh, that we're involved in from Micron. Um, the integrated circuit qualification standard, uh, which is Q100, the multi-chip module version, which is Q104, and a new board level reliability standard that we're working on as well. I love it. You live in a, you live in a world of standards and acronyms. It's amazing. <laughs> so yes. just to finish off, finish off, what's next for Micron and functional safety and what's next for you? Right. So um, for Micron and functional safety, we're continuing to expand our portfolio. Um, so pushing those functional safety efforts into more products and continuing to drive the systematic um, processes and uh, process certification with our third party consultant and product certifications with our third party consultant. Um, so that will allow us to validate capabilities and to continue to put out new products that are uh, capable of being used in systems up to ASLD. Excellent. And you? Well, for me, I, I'm having a great time with functional safety, so I really enjoy it. And I'm hoping to continue to take the learnings from the random hardware analysis that I'm doing um, to improve future products and maybe help identify additional features that we can build into those products. Um, there's a lot going on and it's a, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for this. It's, it's really fascinating to get a peek under the hood, sorry, pun intended, of, of, a, of a critical enabling piece of the, the, the automotive ecosystem going forward. So again, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.